Let's talk about recruiting, culture, people, retention, management, everything you know a lot about. One of the most important things that our CEOs and entrepreneurs do is build their team. Tell us about what advice you would give to founders and CEOs about um, finding the right quality and bring, bringing the right people into the organization. We sort of did a bunch of things the wrong way before figuring out kind of better ways to do it. Um, but one thing we got lucky on uh, that Larry and Sergey set the bid on earlier was interviewing and hiring by committee. Uh, we've always, always taken power away from the hiring manager to make an absolute hiring decision. And the reason is, what their insight was, was early on, they'd look at other startups and what would happen is you'd have a founder or a couple founders and they'd be amazing. And then they'd hire some people, and those people would be also pretty darn good. And then they'd hire a set of people, and they'd be pretty good. And then over time, as the company grows, you get reversion to the mean in the quality of people you hire. And their insight was, everybody gets a little biased. We're biased in how we make decisions. We take thin slices when we assess people. Uh, most interviewing happens in the first 10 seconds, or within the first few minutes. There was this great research done where um, these folks out of University of Toledo, uh, they had trained psychologists interview candidates and assess them on 11 different attributes. They taped it, and they took the least qualified people they could find on the planet, college sophomores, and they had the college sophomores watch the same video without sound. And the college sophomores made the same assessment as the trained interviewers. The researchers thought that was weird, so then they said, what if we only cut the interview down by half to 15 minutes? Same quality results, right? College sophomores, same assessment as trained psychologists trained to assess people. And they kept slicing it thinner and thinner and thinner until they got down to a 10 second clip that they showed college sophomores. And on nine of the 11 attributes, they made the same assessment as trained interviewers. And the reason was things like uh, competence, agreeableness, conscientiousness, intelligence, all these things in theory we hire for, right? What they saw was that what happens in an interview is it's an exercise in confirmation bias. You make a snap judgment based on this thin slice and you assume that that gives you insight into how the person actually is. And without consciously being aware of it, you actually then look for data to affirm this hypothesis you've developed. And as a result, most of us actually are just average at interviewing. And so what Larry and Sergey figured out early was let's have a separate committee assess people. So you have somebody do the interviews. Everybody writes things up. That packet goes to a committee. Committee's sole job is to maintain quality. Hiring manager doesn't get to choose. The team doesn't get to choose, they do their write-ups, but the hiring committee makes the decision and that decision cannot be questioned. And their entire job, keep quality high. Our hiring seems to get better and the evidence I have for that is we actually take packets periodically from five years ago, 10 years ago, you know, as far back as we can go and we run them through hiring committees and we have them rate them based on today's standards and what we find is that the ratings today show that older candidates are actually worse based on the assessment we would give them today versus people we are hiring today. So number one big thing you can do is hire objectively by having a hiring committee. Second thing I'll just quickly mention is uh, structured interview questions. Everyone likes to ask case questions and brain teasers. It turns out our data show that that actually doesn't predict performance. There's no correlation with your ability to do that. Uh, part of the reason is because those are tests of a finite skill rather than flexible intelligence, which is what you actually want to hire for. And structured interview questions are not rocket science. It's you're screening for problem solving. You say, give me an example of a hard problem you solved then you drill down. Uh, but those kinds of questions are actually predictive of how someone will perform versus what we typically do. And you think all these skills will apply to a small company? You're a startup, you're hiring your top three people that you know, must have, same thing? You have a committee of three? How do, how do you go, how does a CEO here in a small company relate to that? We did this from day one. And it screened, and there were a lot of people who, who applied, who didn't get hired, who, who passed over. Um, it seems to have worked in that context. Uh, anecdotally, I've heard from other companies who've been doing it, and it seems to work quite well. It's painful because each of us thinks we're good at this, and particularly as a CEO or a senior executive. The founders are a bit of a special category because there is something you're looking for, but once you get beyond that circle, uh, even if you just have, even if you're just making your fourth or fifth hire, don't make it based on one person's opinion. You have a whole chapter in your book that talks about taking the power away from the manager. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Tell us a story or two, because there's some great ones in your book about yeah. We've all been managed, and what we want when we're managed is we just want to get our work done, right? We just want somebody to get out of our way and we, we've got to set a goal. Somebody says, you know, take that hill. We'll figure out how to do it. We just want to get it done. When we become managers, what do we want? We want to make sure our people get their work done. And as a result of that, 
we kind of get in their business about all kinds of things that we shouldn't because if we've done hiring right and we've hired exceptional, smart, capable, motivated people, actually we need to manage them very little. So part of the issue with management is that when you become a manager, you actually forget everything you knew when you were an employee about what you hated about being managed. And what's crazy is that your organization gets bigger, you're also managed by someone above you, right? And you hate that as well. I mean, we all love our managers and our boss, but you know, to some extent, and you forget that even while you're experiencing this, when you turn around and pivot and look down, the behaviors are, should be different. Um, the other problem is when you're a manager, your employees have an incentive to be less than truthful because they want to be successful in your eyes. And you control their pay, their promotion, you control their self-esteem to an extent. You know, do you give them a nice word or do you, do you yell at them? And as a result of that, they sort of want to show up well for you. So you're never getting a pure perspective on how the people actually are working. So one of the things we do at Google is we rely heavily on peer feedback to do that. But there's all these issues with management where you end up actually not being super effective as a manager. So at the company, we've decided to take as much power away from managers because you're going to have a biased view of your employee's performance. Um, and it's much better to rely on the peer group around them and the people who actually see their work or their customers for feedback because that's going to be more representative. Um, they have incentive to be less than direct and honest with you, not because they're bad people, but, but just because you're putting a roof over their heads and they just want to they continue doing whatever you have them doing. And so we take as much power away as we can. We actually at one point tried to be very extreme about this where Larry once said we shouldn't have any management in the company. And we had uh, you know, less than 1,000 employees. We had a couple hundred managers, maybe 100, 150. And he said, nobody's a manager anymore. And everybody's going to report directly to our head of engineering. So we had something like five or 600 engineers reporting all to one guy <laughs> named Wayne Rosing. And that didn't work either, because we eventually figured out there are some good things managers do. But the key starts with, at least for us, taking power away and having a relationship where your employees have an incentive to be honest with you. So um, training people. Mm -hmm. there's. Uh, there's a story in your book about Tiger Woods practicing golf in the rain. Tell us that story. Somebody shared this story with me. Um, this guy was a student at Stanford University, and he was going to a fraternity party. And it was this awful, awful night. One of the few nights we get out here where it's rain and thunder and storm and dark. And at 11 o'clock at night, he heads out to this fraternity party. And he drives by the golf course or the, the driving range. He goes by the driving range at Stanford, and he sees one guy out there just, just hitting balls, 11 o'clock at night in the driving range. And at the time, he had, he had no idea who it was, right? So he goes to the party, comes back at 3 in the morning. Same guy is still out there hitting balls. In the rain, in the middle of the night, in a thunderstorm. And so he goes up to him, and he says, you know, Tiger, this is crazy. Why are you doing this? And Tiger Woods' response is, it doesn't rain that often in Northern California, so this is the one chance I have to practice. And the lesson embedded in that is there's something to this notion of deliberate, concentrated practice. That anything we do, the conventional view on training and learning and development is, I'm going to take a course on microeconomics, and I'm going to be an expert on microeconomics. Or I'm going to work on being a better leader, and I just need to do these 10 different things, and I'm going to get better at what I do. Or I'm going to be a great CEO, and there's these 12 things I'm going to do. The reality is we learn best when we focus on the smallest possible things. When we do deliberate practice around one small skill that is a constituent component of a much longer thing. So it doesn't make sense, if you want to be a great golfer, to just go out and play lots and lots and lots of golf all the time. Because sometimes it's going to rain. It doesn't rain that often here. So when it rains, you have to focus on that deliberate thing. And it gives you two things. One is immediate repetition of that skill. And the second is immediate feedback and course correction. And the way people learn best is when they have those two things working. So if you're trying to learn in your organization or instill learning in your organization, instead of doing all kinds of big management courses and initiatives, figure out what you want people to focus on and practice that discrete skill. And that works at the individual level, too. I had a manager who, every time when I was in consulting, before a client meeting, he'd go in and say, how do you think the meeting's going to go? What are the roles people are going to play? What's your role? And then we'd come out of the meeting, and he'd say, did it go as you expected? What would you do differently? Why do you think this person did this other thing? And it was literally five minutes before, five minutes after, but it turned every single meeting into this master's class where I wasn't just doing the work, but I was attending and trying different things and learning. And it's that kind of deliberate, daily, regular practice on small skills that actually adds up to large transformations in performance. That's great insight. Thank you for sharing that. 
So um, let's talk about Google. And um, you joined Google from GE, massive company. You had a big job. Before that, you were at McKinsey. You saw a lot of companies. When you joined, there were 6,000 employees, mm -hmm. and now over 55,000? 55, 55, 57,000. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of crazy. So what were your first impressions when you just reflect? And um, what's, what, a, have, what are the kernels of things that have been able to be retained now that it's a giant, massive company? Um, the interview process used to take a long time. So when I started interviewing, Google had 3,000 employees. And by the time I finished and joined, it was 6,000. So it was both a testament to the scale <laughs> wow. of the company and how long it Says took. Says a lot. Um, I think one of the things that's always been constant is this focus on people and culture. And a lot of it was instinctive. And what we've tried to do is actually measure and prove what works and what doesn't and systematize it so that other organizations can do it, but also so we can scale it. Uh, one of the challenges we've had is we, since 2005, have been doing an employee survey, and now it's a census, something like 95% of employees participate in it. And we always ask about culture and how people think the culture is doing. And every single year, people have told us, and we hear this anecdotally on our emails, we're worried about the culture, the culture's changing, it's not the culture I joined. I got an email from an employee who sent it, he, who quit. And what this guy wrote, he was an engineer, he said, this isn't the company I joined. The company I joined was nimble and fast, non-hierarchical, I could get things done, I didn't have to worry about a whole bunch of bureaucracy when it came time to check in code, I could just move and do great things, and I'm done with it, and I'm resigning, and this isn't the company for me, it's just changed too much. And I said, well, you know, nevertheless, I hope you enjoyed your summer internship, and I wish you the best of luck <laughs> back at, at college. And so we've always had this notion of people always feeling like the culture's on the risk of being lost, and it's actually a very positive thing because it's a healthy paranoia about something that actually shapes and drives the company. Yeah. I think there's all these things like the beanbags and lava lamps, you could take all those things away. You'd still have this core of Google. And the proof is, it was that back when all the free food was literally, you know, this guy, Craig Silverstein, showing up and you know, baking bread every Thursday and walking around the hall saying free bread, right? That was, that was the origin of that. <laughs> and so I think uh, the thing that's been learned is how to systematize and scale that um, and keep this sense of healthy paranoia. The beautiful thing about our industry is the history is not that deep, and there's a, been a lot of companies that have risen very quickly and plateaued or risen and fallen, and so we try to be students of that. There's a lot of fantastic tech companies, and you, know, you can all think of them, uh, and you watch the rise and stagnation, and there was one tech firm where they had this employee perk where in the gyms there were towels, and then one day they decided in some cost-cutting exercise, we're actually gonna charge you for the laundry cost of the towels, and it was gonna be something like, two bucks an employee a month or some trivial amount. And people were furious. And it was this tipping point in the culture where it became kind of more cost focused and people, were, people kind of realized this isn't the place I joined. And so part of culture and maintenance is the small signals you give out matter tremendously. As a CEO and founder, people watch you every single second. And it's true if you have two employees, it's true if you have 20,000 employees. The bigger you get, the more that's magnified. And once you have sort of 30 or 40, uh, maybe 50. You don't know everybody in the same way. So things like slamming a door or you know, whether you leave your garbage on the table after lunch in your boardroom or not, those signals get internalized by everyone in the company. And it, that defines who you end up being. Because by the time you have 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 people, a lot of that's out of your hands. And it's all those small signals you and your, your deputies have given that shape everything for good and for ill. So you have to be acutely aware and conscious of this stuff, and I can talk more about that if it's That's great insight, terrific. So um, let's talk about HR. So when you joined McKinsey, somewhere in your career you said, I'm gonna do HR, and a lot of people thought, you're crazy, like why would you do that? Um, a lot of the companies here are small, and they have an HR consultant. What happens with HR over time in a company? And what's the advice that you can share with uh, this group of entrepreneurs? Uh, well, I'd say don't worry about hiring an HR person until you're 100, 150, 200 plus people. We hired our first uh, when we were about, and this predates me, so I say we in, in the royal sense, um, when we had about, I think, 50 people. Stacy Sullivan was employee 51. But generally, I know you've got a lot going on, 
uh, I'm actually, I'm the only person in my family who hasn't founded a company. Both my parents and my brother has two companies. So I'm the black sheep because, you know, I work at Google. And I'm the failure. <laughs> and each of them, like, they've all avoided it. And the reason is you want to actually own this stuff. And you're busy, you have a lot going on, but you want to be thoughtful about the kind of institution you're building. Because you have to imagine, even on day one, someday you will have 50,000 people. Larry today talks about how Google will have one million employees at some point, and that's how we think about it in the company. You have to think about how you want to manage and lead and all these things which you don't have time for because you're struggling for air and you're trying to close a deal and close a quarter and make things happen. But it's essential to get this stuff figured out early. Let's, um, let's move into uh, the area of compensation. So CEOs in this room are responsible for stewards of the dollars and um, how people are compensated is really important. In your book, you talk about paying unfairly. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that and what advice you can give to the CEOs here. Talent doesn't follow a normal distribution. Talent follows a power law distribution. If you look at fields like politics and music and athletics and academic publishing and business, a normal distribution would predict, you know, Few people at the top, few people at the bottom. What actually ends up happening is you have a par much higher number of people with super normal performance than a normal distribution would predict, and their performance is way outsized relative to average. So the easy analogy is if you look at athletics, right? Like LeBron James, way better basketball player than just about anyone out there. Steph Curry, same kind of thing, right? And you don't have to be a basketball fan to have heard these names. These are people who are exceptional. And nobody looks at that and says, oh, that's weird. What a bizarre statistical anomaly that they're way better than average. And the average people in the NBA, you know, they don't sit around going like, oh, the system's unfair. Steph Curry makes many more millions than I do. It's just the performance is observable and measurable, right, to a large extent. Then you have people like Shane Battier. There was a great New York Times Magazine article years ago about how he makes the teams around him better when he was playing for the Houston Rockets. People didn't know that. He was viewed as an average middling player until they figured out his presence actually improves the overall team. And that, it turns out, is a compensable factor. And so his pay improved. He, you know, his career did great. So you see this difference in performance across professions. There was also research done uh, in the 1970s on software engineers, although they were called programmers, in the federal government and the difference between the best and the and average and what would happen if you could hire a little bit better. And long story short, your best people are way, 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 way better than average. And that's true of companies. It's true of individuals. But most pay systems are based on this misguided notion of, of fairness, meaning, well, we can't have differences that are too big. People are going to be upset. And so when you look at salaries, for example, within a job level, there might be a 20 or 30 percent difference. It doesn't make any sense, because your best people are worth way more than that. When I've been on the board of startups, we often have these conversations about, here's our best person, best engineer, what have you. And we want to give them more, but we can't give them 10 times more than the average person, because, well, you know, that's, that's, a, that's just so much more. They're absolutely worth it. And so at Google, our pay curves are exponential. And there's, you know, one of the things I'm, I shared uh, so it's public is that at one point, for example, in one of our stock planning cycles, at the low end, somebody got a $10,000 stock grant. At the high end, somebody got a million dollar stock grant. And this wasn't, you know, pre IPO or just after the IPO. This kind of thing happens every single year. Now, the problem with that is people say, no, it's hard to explain those differences. And that's exactly the challenge you have to overcome. Because in order to pay unfairly, to have these really wide distributions, which actually accurately reflect the difference in capability of the people on your team, what you need to do is be able to justify that to your team. And there's two kinds of ways of justifying it. There's distributive justice and procedural justice. And human beings, get, we get comfortable with either. But distributive justice is, let's make pay transparent. Everyone can see where it is, and then everyone knows how the system works. Problem with that is, when you make pay transparent, no one's ever happy, except for the very top person. Right? Like even this, the person who got the $900,000 bonus or stock grant, they're going to be mad because they, they wanted a million, right? And the person who got a million is immediately going to go like, well, I wish it had been higher, right? <laughs> so instead, what you need is procedural justice where you're able to explain to people, here's how the process works, and here's how we know it's fair. And at Google, that's one of the functions people operations plays is we validate and test and measure and make sure that the outcomes are fair. And we'll actually change the outcomes if they're not. So you can live with that as long as you have a fair process and that your employees understand and appreciate that it's fair. It's not the CEO's brother. It's not my best friend. It's not the son of an important client or something like that. The second thing is, if you want to do this, you need to fix the inequities that exist in society already. 
In the US, women on average make 70 to 90 cents on the dollar compared to men. It, similar pattern persists in a whole bunch of countries. When you get hired at Google, what happens is we base your pay on the job, not your prior pay. So the effect of that is we don't see compensation difference based on gender within Google. So we fix that societal inequity on hire, and then we simply don't create a new one. So if you do those two things, you can have really wide distributions in pay. And the ultimate reason you want to have those wide distributions is because the market is going to pay those people what they're worth. We had someone in sales who once said, um, they said, I want to get paid a percent of Google's revenue. So I just need 10 basis points of Google's revenue. I'm good. You know? <laughs> and obviously, it wasn't exclusively due to that person's performance that Google had revenue. So you want to take into account how much the person actually influences. But you've got to have those wide variations in pay, because otherwise, your people will go get that on the market. And the people you will lose will be your absolute best people who are generating the absolute most value for you. Laszlo, thank you so much. You. This was great. Thanks for sharing your insight. Thank you.